have actually now some uh, video. And that this I rarely do. <coughs> you know this about me. I would like to write everything out uh, as we go along because I want you to see how where things come from instead of just clicking through formulas. But this is one of those topics where you're actually going to need a little bit of visual aid before we can go into the <coughs> It's also a nice way to start up, yes. Let's ease everything into the topic. We are going to talk about cosmology. So this week we are going to apply general relativity to the whole of the universe. So you can apply it to all kinds of smaller systems like the sun or black holes that we did last uh, week, or maybe even to persons or particular situations, or like this bachelor student, or magnetic particles in, 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 in general relativity, all fine. But you can also apply to the universe for its totality, without regard of exactly what goes on within the universe, how does the universe in its totality evolve in time due to general relativity. Now, uh, that needs a particular starting point. And we will get there in a moment. Uh, this is why I, I, I'm going to use some visual aids to get that starting point across. But first, just a question for you. If you're going to describe the universe as a whole in its totality, why why, why look at general relativity in the first place? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff happening in the universe. There's electromagnetic stuff going on. There's strong nuclear forces going on. There's weak nuclear force going on. There is also gravity going on. But of all these forces, why is it that we look to general relativity to do the describing of the whole universe? All the forces live in space-time. No, that is very true. Everything lives in space-time, but usually if you do your atomic physics, you really don't care about general physics effects, right? I mean, I, that is absolutely true. General relativity does work on a large scale, but that's because it works very poorly on a small scale. So at the moment you take an atom and you want to describe how the electrons whirl about, do not take this too literally. We all know that it's a probability distribution, it's not an actual little planet revolving around the nucleus. But if you do your quantum mechanics, sure, your quantum mechanics say you never have to evoke, oh, by the way, there's also a little bit of curvature due to so-called space-time in that atom going on. There is, by the way, it's just completely negligible. So yes, you would expect that generativity plays some role only at a large scale. But my question is, is more stringent than that. Why is it that we completely ignore the three other fundamental interactions of nature when we look at the universe as a whole? They don't act on a large scale? Well, that's, that's true for some of these forces. Isn't it because charge is conserved and the quantum, like the flavors of quantum systems are conserved, whereas because mass is only, it comes in one type, it's not conserved. So overall, the universe has positive energy and positive mass. Okay, I hear a couple of this stuff to unwrap there. I hear you say something about the constancy of particular charges. Electric yes. charge, weak nuclear Like there's form. not more positive charge in the universe than negative charge, so everything in, yes. in electromagnetism will ultimately cancel. Ah, okay, there we go. That, that's what I was looking for. Yes, me. The electromagnetic force is, aside from the strong nuclear force, is the strongest force that we have in nature. But because due to its enormous strength, it also means that if something finds itself accidentally charged, because you brought the cat or something like that, or what have you, you know, not the wooden sweater, right? static electricity. If you find something that is accidentally charged, then the, the strongest, the enormous size of, the, of the, the electromagnetic force makes sure that there will always be some electron being transferred from one place to the next. It starts to make the whole thing neutral again. Yes? Um, the electro, uh, the electro uh, uh, the magnetic charges and, and magnets are extremely difficult to detect historically simply because nature is constantly striving with enormous force to make sure that everything is completely balanced out electrically. Now if you do this, apply this on a grand scale, you understand this completely because stars have all kinds of properties, they have mass and they might have spin, they have heat temperature and all these things, but they, they, they typically do not have charge. Okay? So the, 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 the strong enormous size of, of black magnetic force simply make sure that as far as nature can handle, it will cancel out the, the net charge of the universe. And I think this is also what you meant, that it balances out. Yeah. And aside from that, there's a fact there's, that there's as much plus as minus, so there is a complete net canceling. Yeah. 
Okay, so that means that the universe in its totality, aside from you know, spots here and there where people accidentally petted a cat or something like that, the universe is electrically neutral. So it is a stronger force compared to gravity, it's just that the charges are completely cancelled. So if you're going to look for how the universe evolves, the electromagnetic is not what you're going to look for. How about the other two forces? Strong nuclear, weak nuclear. Strong forces confined to very small distances. Yes, the size of the strong nuclear force is about well, 10 to the power, power minus 15 meters, right? It's very strong on that scale, but outside of that scale, it's, you know, it quickly drops off to zero. So that means, well, the universe is typically bigger than 10 to the minus 15 meters. So that means that uh, whatever it does, it will not do anything on a grand scale. And there's the weak nuclear force. Does that have any influence on a big scale? If not, for one reason? Gamma is decaying, right? So it only lasts for the period of time in which the interactions happen. Well, sure. yes, I mean, the only thing that the, that the weak nuclear force does is that it changes uh, particular types of leptons and other leptons, or particular types of quarks and other quarks. It doesn't have a grand scale uh, properties. In that sense, it's not really a force in the sense that you can write it, say, as a Newtonian force, as in, well, force is this this formula, this many Newtons. Something along that lines you can't say for strong nuclear force because it actually is an attraction or a repulsion. You can say the same thing for electromagnetic. But changing one particle into the other has nothing to do with being attracted or being pushed away. So it, it's, it's simply not the, I mean, we use the word force as if it's something that sort of Newtonian, it isn't. It really is a, a completely <coughs> different kind of in, interaction altogether. But that means there's not that many options left, right? So it is true that, that gravity is of <coughs> all forces ridiculously the weakest. I mean, the amount of the order of magnitude difference between the weakest force, gravity, and its next to weakest force, the weak nuclear force, is e already enormous. So despite gravity being the, by far the weakest of the four forces, it is the only one that survives on the big scale. But that's interesting, because that means if you have a theory of gravity, you can apply it to the universe in its totality. And what do you know? We spent the first three weeks of this course making a theory of gravity. So let's apply it. Now, you know from what we discussed in uh, uh, the do of this course that general relativity consists really, if you make it extremely simple, of two steps, right? We put it in the words of Wheeler last week that we said, well, you have matter or energy that tells space how to curve, and if you have the curvature of space, you can tell how mass it would move. We briefly discussed this equation. Unfortunately, we do not have the full time in this course to really go, this is two to four, this is another five, sorry, it's this. We do not have the time in this course to really go through the whole background of this particular equation. You can read it up in any good book on general relativity. For us, this was a given. You remember this equation? You put on the right side, you put what kind of matter and energy you have in the universe, and the left side spins out your metric tensor. So you solve this, and you get back the metric tensor. For the first two weeks of our course, we know that the metric tensor gives you the curvature of space-time. Everything that you need to know about the curvature of space-time is encapsulated in the metric tensor. You also know that if you have the metric tensor, you get to Wheeler's second part of the very brief summary of general relativity. The metric tensor tells masses how to move. That step um, is, of course, the Geodesic equation. So here's a brief summary. Now we have to apply these equations now to the whole of the universe. We cannot apply this equation if we don't have a metric tensor. We cannot apply this equation if we don't have the amount of energy uh, that there is in the universe. So it seems that we're sort of stuck in what's going to be our starting point. Typically, in general relativity, is people tell you what the amount of energy and mass is, and you calculate the metric tensor, and you take it from there. In cosmology, relativistic cosmology, we're going to do sort of the other way around. We're going to assume what the metric tensor is. And knowing or guessing what the metric tensor is, we're going to calculate how it is connected to energy and matter. Right? 
So you usually start with energy in matter or energy in matter and then you calculate the metric tensor. Now we're going to start with a educated guess of what the metric tensor is and then see what the energy and, uh, and, and matter should be in the universe to make that work. That's going to be the idea. Now once we have a metric tensor and we know how it's connected to the uh, energy and matter in the universe, then we can do our crystals and, and calculate how things will move in that universe. So, so that is the plan for this time. And you will be amazed, I hope, how ridiculously far you can get about the, the whole dynamics of the universe just by this very simple series of steps. All right, so that's the plan. Let's put it into perspective. Again, it's one of the very few times that actually we're going to have some visual aid aside from a marker and a whiteboard. We're going to uh, make an observation about the universe. The observation, let's start with this YouTube one. This is a video. If you start at the biggest scales, on top you see 10 to the power 25 meters, right? Virgo supercluster, so kind of galaxies grouped together. We're just zooming in, and every time you see one of these white circles, zoom in, that means you're, one, you're 10 times closer by. Now, this is the galaxy. We're going to go into our arm, where we are. It's about 10,000 light years from the center. Zooming in, zooming in, zooming in know the amount of uh, space in space. <laughs> First star, the close star, uh, Alpha Centauri we've now passed. Here's the Oort cloud, right? This big dense cloud <coughs> of objects that revolves about uh, the solar system. Here is the solar system. Moving inward. Zooming, zooming, zooming. Here's the orbit of the Earth. There's the Earth. Look, there's the moon. 10 to the power 8 meters, it's about 400,000 kilometers, and of course you zoom in at some point. I, I think this one ends in Italy, if you don't. This is not Italy. Well, if somebody knows where this is, please tell me. My job is very bad. Oh, Venice! Wait a minute, that wasn't Venice. We zoomed, did we? We zoomed past Italy, didn't we? No, 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 no it was all the way to north. Oh, okay. Anyway. Uh, it also goes the other way, going to biology regions, not interesting, okay? <laughs> okay. No, it is interesting, just not for our course. <laughs> so it, it's, it's a very cool video, it's called Powers of Ten, and it's, it zooms in and it zooms out. So you go all the way in, and of course at some point if you, go, if you scroll through the biology, you get back into physics again, because then you get your quarks and your particles and everything, so just where things start getting interesting again. <laughs> um, the observation that I wanted to make with this video is this part. Do not tell about this, by the way, I'm really just joking. Is this part. We are, this was a starting point. If you look at an extremely big scale, you have zoomed out a ridiculous amount, 10 to the power 26 meters. It says 50 billion light years from Earth, so it's, it's really, really, really big. By the way, I'm going to drop a question and let's see if you can think of an answer as we go along, okay? 50 billion light years. That means it takes 50 billion years for light to have reached us. Yet the Earth, as we're going to see, is about 14 billion years old. So you might have to wonder how that light reached us if the distance is about three, four times bigger than the universe has existed for the light to have traveled from there to here. So that's a question I'm dropping. Do not answer that right now. Think about it for a while. There is a paradox there. You don't see the paradox? I don't think I do. Okay. Yeah. Um, the light from you to reach me takes a second, but both of us have only existed for 0.1 seconds. How why would the Earth care? Why, why would the light care about the Earth? It's not about caring about the Earth, it's about the center of when you meant the age of the universe. Oh. Yes. No, it's not the age of the Earth, it's the age of okay, the universe. Okay, okay, okay. No, the yeah, universe yeah. has existed for about 14 billion years. Well, the Earth is 4.9 billion years. The universe <coughs> has existed for about 14 billion years. This is not a guess, by the way, because we're going to calculate that this is the case. Um, so the universe exists for 14 billion years. Okay, no, I mean, then it makes sense. I, uh, I, I, yes. I probably then it makes I sense understood uh, Earth and no, no, I, I wasn't sorry, listening maybe, to the I, exact I think thing. I said universe, but, uh, okay, but maybe I said Earth. I meant you, the universe no, okay. is 14 billion years old. Yeah. Um, 
but light has but light from 50 billion years away has has has, has reached us. So something has been going on there. But uh, I mean, it we'll still makes sense. No? Does it? No. It expands, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Wow. I just leave the question for there, okay? We, we need our mathematical apparatus to answer questions like this, so we're going to build this up. Back to our observation. We're at a very big scale looking at the universe. Um, anything that strikes you from this particular picture? So you say, wait a minute. There's this particular property of the universe, if you look at it from a big enough scale. homogeneous? It looks pretty homogeneous, right? Oh, well, it's not homogeneous. Because you can see some stuff colored. Yeah, that's true. There, there are patches where you see more stars than here, but, uh, or galaxies, I should say. So it's a little bit more dense here than it is at other places. OK, well, that's fine. Um, I agree with you that there's local places where there's a little bit of density, but as a whole, it looks pretty homogeneous. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I see the exceptions, yes. But if, if you would zoom out more and more, it becomes more and more homogeneous. So you look like in the whole universe, like almost homogeneous? Yes. This is just an observation that you can make. The universe looks pretty homogeneous. I mean, and yes, you can find your exceptions, especially on a small scale, because if I would look during the nighttime, I would look out, uh, over there I see a star, and there over there is a star. In between, I don't particularly see a star, and there I see the moon, and this is where I see another galaxy, maybe, a drone or something like that. So on a small enough scale, you can sort of see, well, wait a minute, no, it's not homogeneous. There's a little bit more mass over here than, it, than there is over there. But then you zoom out more and more and more, and it becomes more and more homogeneous. Okay? So that means that um, just as an observational fact, you can say, well, to some approximation, the universe, its mass distribution is very homogeneous. And yes, you can later on make alterations to it. Let you say, well, as a first order approximation is homogeneous, and later on you could add inhomogeneous. From what scale does it become homogeneous? Uh, well, it's, it, it becomes increasingly homogeneous, so there's no particular size that says, and from this moment on it is. It's not a crisp limit, yeah. but uh, it's about 100 megaparsecs. And mega means a million, yeah. and a parsec is about 3.26 light years or so, a little bit more than three light years. So yeah, so it's big. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then, by the way, you can see this here, right? Because we're 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 far past the the, the 100 megaparsecs. Yeah. Because it's about 10 times bigger still, or 20, or 100 times bigger still, something like that. So, uh, but you can see the homogeneity here. Uh, yes, with some exceptions here and there. Yes. I have a question. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but okay. uh, would this be the picture of where all the galaxies are now? or where we detect them to be. Because yeah. that would make quite a lot of difference, I think. Yes, that is a good point. Uh, it is a relevant question. Of course, what, always what you are seeing, if you point out your telescopes, is, is where, they, where they were when they sent out the light. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's the answer. OK, I, I was just thinking maybe they did a calculation or something. Because obviously, if you just look at this, then you can't say this is what the universe is like, because no, you're right. Yeah, no, there, there, basically there, out of date. I know. There's there's travel time in between. You can correct for that. It doesn't does not change homogeneity, by the way. Okay. It, it just means that that they that they, they that they are now maybe further away than they than that they used to be. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that they were evenly distributed. Okay. So the large scale structures stay the same. Yes. Okay. Well, let, let me put it this way: the density, the amount of galaxies or matter that you would find per cubic light year or so, that number changes. But the fact that every cube that you would take in the universe has that same amount at any moment in time, that has stayed the same. So not the number, but the fact that the, whatever the number is, that that number is the same everywhere. Th that property has stayed the same. So this is called homogeneity, yes? Um, so this at, at some point was just you know, a happy observation. Apparently the universe has a you know, equal distribution of mass around, the around its, 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 its amount of space. That's fine. But you can make a stronger statement still. And this was done in the 1960s. It's a famous story that you might not have heard before. And that is that. Um, you can also look at the energy distribution of the universe. This is just matter. Where there's stuff that you can actually touch. Probably burn your hands because stars and everything. 
But you could do a little bit more. Because all these stars and all these things in the universe, they also send out energy, typically in the form of photons. Or neutrinos, if you want. But let's, let's focus on the photons for now. In the 1960s, people started measuring the photons that came to the Earth from different parts of the universe. So the only thing you have to do, really, is just get, your, get yourself a big photon telescope, which I think is just the same as saying a telescope. Right? It collects light. You have to make sure that, uh, that, that it, it collects light of the right wavelength, because the photons that arrive at the Earth are typically uh, uh, extremely uh, red, in the sense that its temperature is about uh, 2.7 kelvins or so. I mean, it's, it's ridiculously red-shifted light. You know this because the universe to you looks black, and it does not look red. But if you're, as, you're, as a biological fact, you had grown up with infrared eyes, then it would have been a beautiful red night sky every night. But you can build machines that do this. So this is what they did in the 1960s. They, they, they built these machines, and they were looking for this cosmic microwave background, as it is called, the CMB. They were t t trying to find out what is the energy of photons that arrive at the Earth from all directions. Now, there were some predictions that uh, could be made, and one of them was there should be sort of evenly distributed amount of temperature over the universe. So no matter where you would look, the temperature of the photons that arrived at you, or the energy of the photons that would arrive at you, would be pretty much the same everywhere. So it, a homogeneity of the, the, the energy of the photons. Now, you probably have seen this picture before. I'm going to show you the latest. That's this one. <coughs> This is not the first picture that they made. The first picture that they made was extremely crude, 1960s. The people who discovered it got the Nobel Prize for it, Isaias and, uh, and Wilson. Um, Some of unfavorably has been called one of the least deserving Nobel Prizes in the history of physics because they were not looking for this effect. They were looking for something else. And then they built a big telescope for whatever it is that they were looking for. They, they saw this and they thought it was just noise in their detectors. Electronic noise, maybe. Uh, famously, they, uh, one of the things that they thought was that maybe birds had flown into their telescope dishes and you know, defiled the surface of the thing. So they actually went in or sent some PSU students in to scrub that stuff off, and, but they could not get rid of this stuff. And then they called their colleagues. Uh, uh, Robert Dicker was one of the people that they called, a famous person in gravitational physics. And they said, well, yeah, we did this experiment, and whatever we do, we have this noise that we cannot get rid of. And Dick and his group had actually <laughs> calculated that this stuff should be there. They knew what it was for. But you give Nobel Prize to people who find things, not people who fully understand them, maybe. So Penzias and Wilson got the Nobel Prize for something they were not looking for and did not understand when they saw it. Maybe I'm selling that short, but this is, this is famously what they say about this particular uh, Nobel Prize. Now, fact is, this is a measurable effect, and it's real. Now what you see here in the picture is uh, really just a uh, picture of, of the night sky. So if you would envision the Earth being surrounded by this big sphere itself, you look at the inside of that sphere, you can make sort of a world map of how that would look. And just as normal globe maps of the Earth, if you put it on 2D, well you know about this now, right? This is non-Euclidean geometry, so you cannot put it in two dimensions. And um, it would look typically like this. So this is the inside of that sphere from which the photons come. This is how you can view this. And you see that these colors, it says something about the temperature of the photons, the temperature of the radiation that arrives at Earth. You see, well, it's not particularly homogeneous because there are some blue spots, you have some red spots, so you have some warmer photons and colder photons. Um, and the, the redness and blueness gives you the idea that apparently there is quite some difference between the one photon and the next, but the scale of this is 10 to the power of minus 5. <coughs> so 1% difference is 10 to the power of minus 2, and it's a thousand times smaller still. So the warm photons and the, 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 the not so warm photons only differ by one thousandth of a percent in their temperature, or in their energy, if you will. And that's interesting, because it means that uh, apparently the energy that, that comes to the Earth from whatever point in the universe, no matter where you look, it's pretty much the same temperature. This is 2.73 kelvins that I mentioned. Okay, you can convert this to wavelengths. It's somewhere in the far infrared that I don't know the number. But put a Boltzmann constant in and an h bar, and you will get there. Both of them are one, by the way, <laughs> in the theoretical physics. But you can calculate what that number is. The, the point here is it's ridiculously homogeneous, much more so, if you will, than the matter distribution. Okay, so 
Um, two points of observation here. You can really tell that the energy and matter distribution of the universe is ridiculously homogeneous. The energy tells you more than the mass does. Now let's go back to our program. Because the big plan was, can we turn this into a metric tensor? Again, we're doing the opposite route. Usually you start with energy, one, energy and, and, and matter, and you get back your metric tensor. Let's do the other way around. Let's try to think of a metric tensor that corresponds to this ridiculous homogeneity of matter and energy. By the way, that statement that the universe is ridiculously homogeneous in its matter and energy distribution is called the cosmological principle. And yes, you write it with capital letters because it's a starting point of relativity in cosmology. The cosmological principle, in fact, let's write it down myself. The cosmological <coughs> principle states that the matter and energy distribution. in the universe is homogeneous. And yes, you can, if you want, you can add uh, uh, starting from one of the megaparsecs of that order of magnitude. By the way, the statement is a little bit stronger, actually. And what we are now saying is that uh, it looks homogeneous from our observations, but it may be for some reason it is not homogeneous, it just looks homogeneous from this particular point in the universe where we are looking. Does that make sense? It, it, it will be unlikely, but maybe there's some reason that we don't know of that says, well, there's only one point in the universe from which the universe looks homogeneous, and if you would have looked at any other point, it would not have been homogeneous. It be and it happens to be exactly the Earth. Uh, you, would be, you would be surprised how many people who are of extremely religious conviction make that point. No, that happens, really. <coughs> and, and, and really, if you think about it, there's no reason, in principle, to say that that is not true. We can well, just go to the Yes, yes, but, but, yet, but you need to uh, do a whole megaparsecs, yes, before you might see any deviations from that. So going to the moon and then doing your check is not, is not a good check. <laughs> and yes. nobody knows how to do the 100 megaparsec uh, 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 travel thing. So the, the statement is a little bit stronger. So maybe it's not just true that the universe is homogeneous. Maybe that's also true at any moment, at any point where you would care to look. So there's another word that comes into play, it's called is isotropy. So let's add that. Isotropy means that no matter in what direction you look, you will see the same homogeneity. There's two statements here. One of them is, is homogeneous, and the second statement is, no matter in what direction you look, it looks homogeneous. Um, you see the difference between the two statements. It's important to do. One of them you can test by these observations. This will be the isotropy. <coughs> the measurement here is uh, uh, the isotropy that you're measuring. It says that if you're at the Earth and you look around, then it looks the same everywhere. That's isotropy. That's the one that you can test. And the second one, if you will, is more like a, a, an assumption. That is that if you would you know, take your experiment not to the moon with 100 megaparsecs away, and then you would look around, it would still look isotropic. The second statement is a lot harder in practice to test. To test. It is a good question how to, if you cannot do the experiment practically, can you still test it? And one possible answer is, well, let's suppose that it is true. Get our general relativity out of that do predictions and then check those predictions. If the, the predictions do not hold, then maybe one of your assumptions was wrong. So there is a way to do this, to do this second check. But at this point, one of them is an assumption, the other one is a, uh, it's an experimental fact. So let's take the cosmological principle and let's build it into a metric tensor. Now we already discussed that 
um, the only thing that could operate uh, on the universe in its totality is gravity, right? We discarded the other three forces. And you also knew from the last couple of weeks that everything in gravity is explainable as a curved space time, and everything that's curved space time is the metric tensor. So that means all of this should be reflected in the metric tensor and in the metric tensor only. It does not leak out to one of the other forces because the other forces don't, don't make any statements about the universe in its totality. It can only be gravity, and everything about gravity should be in the metric tensor. So all of this should all be in this equality sign. And now we come to the point that we have to make an educated guess what a good metric tensor is that has the cosmological principle built in. And I'm open to... Uh, I think we just assume that it's homogeneous everywhere. Yes. That means there's no curvature overall, right? Because is it's equally certain. Is that true? Everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're saying... So well, you... Well... Let's yeah. go to, Sorry. I would assume it's just basically the uh, Minkowski space time divided by whatever amount of mass there is in every position. That is actually a good point. I mean, I mean if there's one thing that's both homogeneous and isotropic, it's Minkowski space time. Okay? That works. <laughs> in fact, uh, let's take... No, no, it's fine. Let's take that as one of the options. And then, I mean, somehow you still have to incorporate the mass in there. No, so that's what this equation does for you. The equation oh, yeah. will, will couple your metric tensor to the mass. Oh, so yeah, the, yeah. that part will be taken care of when we work with that one. But sure, why not? I mean, Minkowski space-time indeed is homogeneous and isotropic. It, it fits the cosmological principle. What about the celestial tensor? Is there a That's a good question for the audience. How about the Schwarzschild metric tensor? Does it fit? It's not isotropic. Uh, no, it, it's not isotropic. It's not isotropic. Well, uh, it's isotropic, but it's not uh, on the genus. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. matter. Here's a short answer. The Schwarzschild metric is isotropic because if you're at the center of the, the bias will do to the black hole and everything. But if you were at the center of the thing, you would look around. It would look the same in all directions. So it is isotropic. It's not homogeneous because if you would stand away from the thing, it would look it would look different in all directions. Sorry? Because the mass would end somewhere. Yes, because the mass is someplace else. In, in that sense, it's very much like, like if you play a game of darts or something like that, right? You have the bullseye, and you have all these rings around it. Let's forget about that the rings have different numbers, and that they're black and, 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 and red and everything. If you stand in the middle of a dartboard, and you would look around, it would look the same in all directions. It is isotropic. But if you would stand in any of the other fields, of your dartboard, the one that gives you different points than bullseye, and you would dare look around, then it certainly does not look the same in all directions. So, Schwarzschild unfortunately does not qualify for this principle. But Minkowski does. Question is, is that the only space-time that you can think of that is homogeneous and isotropic? I mean, you have stuff like spherical space-time, but that's not very likely, is it? Why not? I mean, I suppose it works, and you can also probably do the same thing with hyperbolic space-time and uh, cylindrical space-time. Uh, cylindrical, I'm not too sure about, though. I mean, it's flat space-time after all, so cylindrical yes, exactly. just comes with, yeah, so. So. But yeah, I guess those are the three, then. But flat just seems the nicest. Yes. Yes, but okay, but we're looking for mathematical options, yes? For, for, unfortunately, the universe does not say, you know what, of all the options that I have, I'm taking the one that's failing to have to select most. <laughs> what about Occam's razor? It supports that <coughs> point, doesn't it? But the, how does Occam's razor apply here? Why is this one? The simplest one. No, 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 Occam's razor says the most economical one, the, the one that takes the least assumptions. Oh, yeah, true. And, and because simple in, in a certain way is really, I yeah, no, 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 consider spherical yes, space time right. more simple than Minkowski. It's subjective. But the amount of assumptions that you need, the Occam's razor would not differentiate between the three. And in fact, let's uh, step away from Occam or, or Felix. Of course, people have been thinking about this. And there were a number of people who came up with the only three options, space time curvatures, that would agree with this principle. It's a, there's a mathematical proof for this. Want you can look it up. It's in some advanced books on uh, uh, general relativity or cosmology. The, the big whiteboard book that I showed you a couple of times has the proof in it. Um, is that these three are actually the only possibilities? Is spherical space time, 
in hyperbolic spacetime. We'll discuss in a moment what that is. Well, and of course, some variety of the, of the Minkowski spacetime. Right. So this option. <coughs> curiosity, do they know which one it is? Uh, well, experiment will have to tell you, and I know what the answer is. Okay, I have my clear favorites here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see if the universe will agree with you. Okay. By the way, I'm I have to switch this off in some uh, some manner. I'm sure there's a white in here somewhere. Projector, projector off. That sounds uh, promising. <laughs> Good. Uh, Minkowski spacetime is. Let's make this grid here. It doesn't matter whether you're standing here or standing over there. In any direction, you will see as many of these grid points uh, as in any other position that you would have cared to look. So, yes, it's homogeneous and isotropic. Fine. Uh, spherical spacetime, a little bit more difficult to draw. It wasn't to be sarcastic, it really is. Because here, you have your sphere. You look good job, it's not that bad. <laughs> this. Now, if you were at this particular point in the space time and you would look around, you will see in every direction as much, much curvature as you would have seen if you would have taken this <coughs> point. Not so much my picture, maybe, but, uh, right? I mean, if you would be standing on the surface of a beautiful spherical symmetric object, in every direction you would look, you would see the same. Now, the reason why it's a little bit difficult to fully envision this is because we're not talking about a two-dimensional sphere from which, in principle, you could still look up, look outward, because then it might look different. I'm talking about, suppose that the whole universe is all on this sphere. There is no extra dimension that you can point out to point inward. In order to do that correctly, I need to draw the surface of a four-dimensional space size sphere. And that I don't know how to do. <laughs> okay? So I, I, can, I, can, I can make this point by taking a two-dimensional sphere, we stick ourselves to the surface, and you have to make a mathematical loop, uh, uh, leap in your hand that you go to the surface of a four-dimensional. Well, no, no. Actually, is it four-dimensional? I'm wrong there. Space size is four-dimensional, but it's a statement about only space. You need the surface of a three-dimensional sphere. The surface of a three-dimensional sphere. So that surface is, is three-dimensional, and the sphere is well, hard to draw. So it's the cosmological principle only applies to three D space. Yes. Not space. Yes, because the, the, no, it's 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 a statement about space, not so much about the time. But the time will factor in in a moment because, you, as you know, in relativity, you cannot say make statements about, about space without making statements about time. Well, finally, get a hyperbolical one. This actually might look familiar to you if I'm going to draw this. So, hyperbolical is sort of like an inverse sphere. So you just live on the inside of the sphere you drew before. It would look like this. Isn't it it's and it's, 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 as best as I can draw, I'm trying, trying to draw, draw this in hyperbole. But a parabola, yes, there is a difference. One of them is 1 over uh, x, and the other one is, is uh, x squared or something like that. I cannot draw any better than this. Okay. But isn't that a hyperbola like a tent? I don't know. It's a concave. Yeah, sure. It, 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 it extends both ways. But this point in the middle. So, yeah, as, as, as best as I can draw. Uh, fortunately, at some point, there's mathematics that takes over. The idea is that um, uh, you can. Uh, take this space here, and again here, it doesn't matter in what direction you look and at what point you do the looking, as, as long as you don't go to the other side here, you will get the same amount of, of uh, curvature no, no matter where you look. Again, my picture is completely imperfect, so I'm going to let mathematics take over in a while, and I'm going to see it explicitly. But if you stand at the bottom point, it looks like the green lines are closer to I fully agree, but I, I fully admit that my picture is just not doing this, this picture service. So the best I can do, in fact, that's one of the exercises of the tutorial, is that I give you the formula, the mathematical formula for a hyperbolic space, let you calculate two geodesics, and, let, and then ask you whether they get closer or uh, further away from each other, 
And if the amount of closeness or getting away from each other is dependent on where you, where you start, if the latter answer is no, then you have the same curve at any point in space. But again, this is much easier in mathematics than it is in drawing. So my apologies for being a crappy drawer. But, uh, there is a third option. So it's easily written out in mathematics. Yes? I'm sure if it really works this way, but I mean, whenever we talk about spherical space time, we assume that we're on the outside of the sphere. Yes. So everything uh, is um, convex. That's well, we could just as well be on the inside and everything will be concave. Would yes. that be That's a good representation. an actual difference? The, the, would, would that be the hyperbolic space time? Yes. That would just be that. Yes. So it's really just walk along the inside it's, it's, it's of the sphere. It's like walking along the inside of the sphere. Okay. Yes. These are the only three options. Now, I hope you understand of each of these three options that it agrees with the cosmological principle as long as you stick to space. Yes? Now, there's a question, are there more options? And that answer is no. But we don't have the time to go into that. But feel free to look up. Now, <coughs> so there's some other expressions. But we're selling ourselves a little bit short here. These are the only three options in space. But we need some time dependence in the system as well. And it's not just because we already know from reading the newspapers and popular science that the universe is, is expanding, which is not allowed to be done with any time dependence in there. Um, you can actually mathematically make a statement about that, namely, the cosmological principle just states that if at a particular moment in time you would look around at any moment in space, at position in space, it would look the same. It does not make any statements on whether five seconds later it would be the same amount of uh, matter or energy per cubic meter. Yes? These three options as they stand now say that if you are at any position in space, and you would look around you, you would see the same amount of matter and energy. But the way that they are written right now says that that number that you would find for how, many, how much matter and energy you see is also the same number in time. So if you would look in one week from now and you would do the experiment, you would still get the same number. But this statement is not about when you look. It just says in what direction and from what point you are looking. So do you see that there is, we haven't fully exhausted the options yet. You could have a space-time that looks the same in all directions and see for every point, the cosmological principle uh, in the spatial way of, of putting it. But if you would do the experiment five weeks later or five billion years later, you would still get homogeneity and is isotropy. It's just the numbers might be different than five billion years ago. But the homogeneity still stands, and the isotropy still stands. So my question is, if you understand that this is a little bit too restrictive, you're allowed to put some time part in. How would you, do the, how would you put the time part in such that any later moment in time, five weeks or five billion years from now, you would still have homogeneity and isotropy? It's just possibly a different number, but the homogeneity and isotropy still stands. How would you build that in? Just represent the spherical coordinates, and then change the radius r, because you have the middle, so if the radius changes, I actually, uh, both of them are still. I, uh, I very much agree with that. That would be a good idea. If you live on a spherical space, take the <coughs> sphere. How about you blow up the sphere? Five billion years later, it's, it's still a sphere. It's just a different sphere. Note that the bigger sphere still looks the same at any point in every direction. Again, the number has changed, how much matter you will see per direction and at one moment, but it's still homogeneous and isotropic. Yes? I have a question. Um, you're talking about curve the about curving the time component of space-time? No, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm not making a statement about whether it's okay. curved. I'm just making a statement that there should be some time component in. Hmm. Okay. Some because statement about time. Because if time was curved, that would mean if you waited long enough, you would end up where you started. Yes. Okay. It, it might be the case. 
Hmm. The only thing that I'm stating now is there should be something with time in there. And Felix's way of, of expressing this would be, well, just take, when I'm taking this example for now, it's easiest to represent. Just take the sphere, just make the radius of the sphere, of the sphere bigger. Right? In Minkowski space time, you can, you can very much have the same thing. Let's wait five billion years. <coughs> we get the same grid. It's just that the grid points are now further away from each other. Still homogeneity, still isotropy. Now, hyperbolic, I don't even dare to, to draw, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same idea. Okay? Now, this is all fine. We know in principle how to do it. We have to take some time dependence in which, in the case of the sphere, just means make the radius of the sphere bigger. Any idea how to do this in mathematical terms? Let's do the Minkowski one. That's the easiest, I think, to determine. The R component of the metric tensor should have been T. Okay, so maybe we should do that. I'm just going to go with your example, and you tell me whether it's, it's what you wanted. Let's write the Minkowski space time. Let's do it in spherical coordinates, because then I think it's easier to do. Well, you know the Minkowski metric in spherical coordinates, right? It's minus 1, uh, 1 r squared, r squared sine squared theta. You remember this from a couple of tutorials ago that we derived the spatial part, the type that we just put in because it's reflect space and time. This is the Minkowski space time in spherical coordinates. Okay, what do we do? Uh, I'm just saying the R could be dependent on T as well. Okay. It could be cross terms of the So let's put a T at this here. Would that work? Well, that's the five. Uh, oh, you mean, you mean as a function? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just put a time dependence in there, maybe something like that. Could that work? Yeah. Okay. No, that works. Right now, what you have is the Minkowski space time written in spherical co coordinates. It's just that you make the radius of that sphere, you make it bigger. That works. I'm actually quite happy with this. Um, does the time dependence change the space time? Does it change the space time yes, it does. or does it just say that it's subject to expansion? We will find that that is what that is something that this that this will answer. What this metric test will do to things, yes. Right now I'm just saying we need homogeneity and isotropy, there needs to be some time dependence, and your suggestion was well, right about this, make it the time dependent. Sure, that works. Now, let's try it out just for a second. Your suggestion was make these time dependent. Agree? It's almost correct, though. Because you know that if you ignore the dt part, then this is the amount of distance you would have between any two points. Maybe dr as well. Yes, dr as well. If you would only take these with an additional time dependence, you're just saying that the angles contract, not in a mathematical sense, but get closer or further away from each other. But if you want to have a really full idea of that everything expands in such a way that isotropy and homogeneity are still conserved, then the R direction should also stretch up. So it's a good suggestion, it's just not fully complete yet. Right now, making these time dependent just means that the angular distance between any two points stretch out or get closer, but not the radial part. Or, if you will, um, which one of the two are we breaking if we don't take the T dependence in the R coordinate? Is it homogeneity or is it isotropy that we're breaking? Homogeneity. Because from the middle still looks the same in any direction because well, the Yes, you're breaking, yes, same. exactly. You're breaking homogeneity. Like yes. So the, the option with only these, making only these time dependent, is isotropic, it's just not homogeneous. So what if you replace the one with some function of t? Because then your dr component would also. How about this? All the spatial parts get some overall function of t, you don't know what it is. That's to be determined. 
But whatever stretching you do in any direction, it's the same stretching in every direction, in any spatial direction. This would work. Because what you would have, so you would get an A here, you would get an additional A here. We're going to talk about what A means exactly, but this would be an option. You've made all directions in space. If they do some expanding or, 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 or contracting, all directions in space would have the same amount. Can you just ignore that? Um, that is a good question. If you, let me leave that question for a second. It, 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 it's a good question, and it uh, uh, has something to do with the Stormer statement still. That's called the, uh, the perfect cosmological principle. <coughs> it's been abandoned since fear for 50 years or so. Um, but it, it, it adds a layer of subtlety that I would like to avoid for now. I, I will get back to it if you want. Yes. But for now, we're just focusing on the, uh, the spatial parts. This one, with this, at this point, unknown function A of t, is fully in agreement with the cosmological principle. Works perfectly. It's completely fine. The question, of course, is what is A? We will get there. Now, so we've now made this one, the Minkowski space-time plus this additional factor of A, we've now made part of our uh, cosmological principle, so it's, it's all fine. The, we have to do, do the same for the, for the spherical universe and for the uh, hyperbolic universe, so these two options. Now, we also studied what the spherical space-time looks like, and we can play the same game there. So you might want to look through your notes what the surface of a sphere looks like. Add to its spatial directions, again, this factor of A, but to all three spatial corners, do the same amount of A. You will get, with, uh, you will get an, uh, another expression for a space-time metric for a spherical universe that, in principle, could be got bigger or smaller. I'm deliberately not giving you the expression because that's one of the exercises. The hyperbolic one, same thing. If you can write down this space-time metric, we haven't done that yet in the tutorials. Again, it's an exercise. But if you were to write down the space-time metric of a hyperbolic universe, and you would allow, again, its spatial dependencies, all three of them, to have the same amount of expansion, A, as a function of T, you will end up with, yet again, a space-time metric that is fully in agreement with this. Here's my statement. Again, this is something that we're going to discuss during the tutorial. All three options can be written into one big sweeping metric tensor, where all three options are accounted for. Here it is. Three options, as we saw. Either you have this, well, this, this sort of expanding version of a flat universe that corresponds to k is zero. In fact, you can immediately tell if you put k is zero, you get exactly this expression here. By the way, for <coughs> historical reasons, the a's come with a factor of with the square on top. I introduce it as an a, as I say, there is some function there. Historically speaking, they write this function as a squared. So you can immediately tell if you put k is 0 here, you get exactly this option, the Minkowski version of an expanding universe. This one is called Minkowski flat. Oh, excuse me, k is 0. There is well two other options. k is either positive or negative. Those are the only flavors that you would have. Now you can talk about whether that's positive number is 5 or 1 or 533. If you want, that's just a measure of how you define your units, how many meters is one meter in the universe. It's, so there, there's, there's no point in talking about exactly what that positive value is, as long as it, as it is it's positive. So the case one option, that's a spherical universe. So that's 
this one. The final option, will not be surprised, it's minus one. That one is the hyperbolic universe. Again, the derivation of this full metric tensor is one of the exercises of the tutorial. So you have some fun uh, there, I think, to find out how that works. This metric is what we were looking for in our program. We were going to look for a metric tensor that agrees with the cosmological principle. Now put it into the Einstein field equations, the equation all the way in the left out there and then get back what the corresponding energy and uh, matter must have been in the universe to end up with either of these three options. Before the break, let's take that to its final conclusion, and then after break we're going to use the resulting equation to actually predict some uh, evolution of, of the universe. All good on this part? Good. Because we, fully, we haven't fully exhausted yet the cosmological principle, we've used it now to specify what the metric can look like. These are the only mathematical options that you have. But we can use the cosmological principle one more time. And that is to make a professional guess what the energy momentum should be. This thing, this tensor T mu nu, tells you how much uh, energy, momentum, and mass there is in the universe. And we have used the cosmological principle to say, well, this part, where the metric tensor appears, should be something like that. But the cosmological principle also, well, by definition, says something about where you would actually have energy and matter, right? So if you will, it's much more a direct statement of this object than it was on the left-hand side of the equation. I mean, if, if there's one thing that cosmological principle tells you, is the universe has the same amount of matter and energy at any point where you look, seen from any point where you look. So that means that whatever this object is, we can also make an estimated guess of what that object is. Now, if you were to compare the universe to Something that has the same amount of matter everywhere. Is there something in physics that you would think, you know what? This particular entity in physics has the same matter everywhere. It's a very roundabout way of asking very, something very simple. Anything that you could think of that no matter where you would look at that thing, it has the same amount of matter? Would that be a black hole? No, no, it don't be, no that doesn't, because it, it, it ends with its matter uh, outside of 2M. Uh, how much size are we talking about? Universe size. Well, not the universe itself. Yes, but you know, the, 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 yes, that is it is true. It's just <laughs> ontology. I want you to express the universe in terms of the universe. That, that, that okay. doesn't work. No, guys, it's much more simple. Think of something, make it, scale it into a small size, something I can hold in my hand, and it has the same amount of matter everywhere. Sphere. Sorry? A sphere. Uh, that's, the, that's the amount of curvature that would be the same. We've already used that. It's the amount of matter. It's actually quite simple. This is one of those times that you think, oh, that's what the guy meant when he asked. Are you talking about a liquid or a gas or something? Or uh, there you go. How about a liquid or a gas? Just your basic thermodynamics. You take a glass of milk. If there's one nice thing about the glass of milk is, as long as you confine yourself to where the liquid is, it has the same amount of, say, pressure, the same amount of matter at any point in space, no matter where you look in the milk, you will find the same amount of milk particles. Don't, do not let the chemist hear this, what I say. Okay? Wait, so how is that different from a black hole? Like, if you are inside a black hole, yes. then everywhere you look, there is the same amount of black holeness. Um, yes, but would you be able to write a black hole in terms of, of its matter content? I have no idea. Okay, well, we discussed this last week. And in the, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's not meant as, 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 uh, as, as to write you off, because it is a good point. A black hole, in, in, indeed, as long as you confine yourself to the black hole, it has the same amount of black holeness, no matter where you look in the black hole. It's true. It's just that the black hole doesn't consist of matter. The black hole consists of a particular uh, amount of curvature of space-time. 
and that means I'm, I'm, I'm going to put in, in my energy momentum tensor something that itself is curved space time. That, that would probably complicate the situation. We can do a lot better than that, or easier. Your suggestion is completely right. A liquid or a gas has the same amount of stuff everywhere that you look within the liquid or a gas. So, um, a brilliant person, Russian scientist called Friedman, did exactly that. He said, you know what? I know how to write down the energy the momentum tensor, that's how this thing is called, for a gas. It's a known expression. Now, where to get that expression from, this is where you have to do your Lagrangian physics in full detail. If you want to see where it comes from, I have to supply you with the, with, with, with the derivation. But now we're going to take the thing as is. Okay? So, the, con the concept more, is now more important than the full derivation of the thing. But we are going to put the cosmological principle also in this thing. We're going to assume that the universe is filled with a gas. It's a very dilute gas. Okay? But at a scale of 100 megaparsecs, you have about one universe particle, being a galaxy or something like that, per unit volume. And you have the same amount of these particles uh, everywhere, just like you would in a gas. So you might say this thing is just the energy momentum tensor that you would have for a gas. So I'm going to write down that expression right here. Here is the energy momentum tensor of a gas. Now, by the way, what numbers do you need to, to express a gas to begin with? OK, I hear pressure. Good. Yes? Temperature. Temperature, volume, fine. That, that, that's usually it, yes, for an ideal gas. And they're related to each other. P, B is, uh, is uh, proportional to the temperature, with the amount of particles in there. Um, that's all correct. Um, all of these, oh, uh, let's take one step back. If you want to describe a perfect gas, right, its equation of state is this. I'm sure you saw this at thermodynamics or physical chemistry or something like that, yes, where n is the amount of moles. R is the ideal gas constant, here's the temperature, here's these things. Uh, the big point is you only need three of these numbers. You need its pressure, its volume, and its temperature. But if you think about it, you only need two because this equation tells you what the third one is in terms of the original two. So you might as well say, you know, I only need two numbers to express the gas. It's up to you to decide whether you want to take pressure and volume, or pressure and temperature, or volume and temperature. That's up to you to decide. In cosmology, people do away with the temperature part. You can put it back in using equations like this, but you need only two numbers, and the numbers they typically take are the pressure, not the volume, but the energy density. How much energy you have per cubic volume of, 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 of in this case, the universe. So this thing is going to be an expression of the energy density of the universe and its pressure. Now. I hope you agree with you, pressure is probably, probably going to be small, right? Because the amount of particles you find in interstellar medium is about one hydrogen atom or so per cubic meter. So the amount of pushing that to do against you is extremely limited. So P is going to be some small number in principle. And so is the energy. Let me write down the energy momentum tensor for this gas. You add them together. It's not as simple as it. This you're missing a couple of indices. Yes, you need a mu and a u on the other side. Two formal meta. Here's your metric tensor in which the gas happens to live. This particular curve of space time times the pressure itself. Now this expression that indeed you can write the energy and the mass distribution of an ideal gas in this particular way is a statement from Lagrangian physics. Uh, I'm going to provide you with, with a reference to see where it comes from for the people interested in Lagrangian physics. But conceptually I hope you understand that this is possible. You can write the energy momentum in terms of only the pressure and only the density. By the way, pressure and density, are these position dependent? Oh, these functions on the right? Yes, no. No, that's a cosmological principle again. Okay. 
That's the whole idea that you put an ideal gas in in the first place. It, it, they can be time dependent, right? Because if the universe is expanding, you would expect that the same amount of matter in more and more volume would result in, a, in a density becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Also, the amount of particles pushing against you if you happen to be floating through space, which is a measure of its pressure, will also decrease if the universe itself expands. So you do expand with this, you do expect this to be time dependent. Is U the proper velocity? Yes. U is the proper velocity of that particular space of volume that you happen to be looking at. Because the statement is about if you were in a particular piece of volume of space, how much pressure would you feel there? How much energy density would you see so there? The space itself has a velocity, uh, whatever is in, in space. This hypothetical little cube of space time that you happen to be looking at, yes, that the principle can move about through space. Okay. That should not be surprising because if you would have, if we, as we will see later, an expanding universe, that just means that all little qubits of space are going to move away from each other. Yeah. That's that thing. So, what does this thing mean? It's a four velocity. What four velocity? Well, let's take a little small cube of space time. How fast that is moving through, through the rest of space time? That's what this thing means. Okay. Now, we now have all the ingredients. We really have now <laughs> taken the cosmological principle and we ran with it, right? We took it to make an estimated guess of what your uh, metric tensor would look like, and therefore the whole left-hand side of your uh, Einstein field equation. We've also taken the thing to say, well, in that case, the universe is sort of like a gas. Let's take from Lagrangian physics what the energy momentum tensor of a gas looks like. That would look like this. And the only thing that remains to be done right now is that you take this expression, <coughs> you put it in here. You take this expression, put it in here, and equate them to each other as the Isaac field equations say that they should be. And that will result in a relationship between the density and the pressure of the gas and this function A that we're looking for. How do you get R mu again? The first time again, that is an exercise I'm going to give to you. Because I, I didn't mention the thing once, R mu is called the Ricci tensor. And it's a very particular combination of derivatives, be careful now, of derivatives of the Christoffel symbols. And yes, you, we're not going to do ourselves any favors by calculating uh, these things by hand. But do you need to know the metric tensor to know that? Yes, yes, the thing is completely metric tensor dependent. So if I give you the metric tensor, you can calculate the Ricci tensor. And if you have the Ricci tensor, and you take its contraction with G mu nu itself, this, then you end up with this thing here. Now, it so happens, that because of the extreme benign way that this metric tensor looks, many of the Christoffel symbols are going to be zero. We've seen this before in some situations. And therefore, calculating the Ricci tensor and the corresponding Riemann tensor is going to be, it takes a little bit of time, but not enormous amounts of time. You can easily see this is going to be zero, that's going to be zero, that's going to be zero. So again, it's a mathematical step that I happily give back to you. I will give you the answer, and then let's take a break and let's solve these equations. So, you put all of this together, this and that into that, you end up with only two equations. I hope that's not surprising to you, because there's two pieces of information you're going to put in, pressure and density, so you're going to have two equations that come out. But both equations will only specify one function. That's the only one that's un unspecified. So you sort of have going to have two equations that both of them try to specify this one factor of A, and I hope you see that if two equations are fighting for dominance what A should be, there's only going to be very restricted answers to that problem. Those are the actual uh, expansions of the universe and, and possible contractions of the universe. Let me write down what the resulting equations are. They're called after the guy that I mentioned before who came up with this idea. They're called the Friedman equations, two of them. One of them says, take this thing, this A, by the way, the thing is called the scale factor, because it scales up the universe or makes it smaller. You take the scale factor, you take its time derivative. Dot just means derivative with respect to time. Then divide by the scale factor itself, equals 8 pi over 3. That a pi is just this a pi. 
times rho, this one, the energy density, <coughs> minus k, which of the three curvatures you have in the universe, the amount of curvature that the universe has of, has of its own in order to make sure that it agrees with the cosmological principle, squared. This is called the first Friedman equation. Is A still dependent on T? Yes, 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 yes. Why aren't you being lazy here? All of this is only T dependent. They're not space dependent, position dependent, otherwise oh, you would break the cosmology. Energy density. Yes. Obviously, if the universe expands, you get the same amount of particles in less volume, or more volume, so you get less density. So you can sort of already see that these things should be related to each other, right? If you scale up the universe, you should end up with less density. This, this equation should reflect that. And they do. That's what the first. What is K called again? Uh, the scale factor. Because it scales the universe. And there's a second Friedman equation. minus 4 pi over 3 times the energy density plus 3 times the, uh, the pressure. And maybe if you give it a little thought, you can understand where the 3 comes from. Where does the pi come from? Is that just because you're using static No, the pi comes directly from this term here. And where does that pi come from? <laughs> from the VR delta function. If you remember, uh, at some point I gave a very brief explanation where this equation comes from in the first place. And I said that if you want to describe the curve for space-time, gravity. But you know the gravity has something to do with accelerations. Then you're going to need at least two derivatives of the metric tensor. That means that you have to take derivatives of the Christoph symbol because that gives you a second derivative. There's an, uh, an equation or a, a theorem in, in tensor theory that says if you want to write down the most general tensor that can be written as second derivatives of the metric tensor, so you're looking for whatever tensor that can at most have two derivatives of the metric tensor, then it's always going to be this thing, Ricci tensor, minus or plus some number times this combination. So that's just a, a theorem for mathematics. Every tensor that should be written as sec second derivatives of the metric tensor has always this form. And then Einstein thought, I just have to look for this number and that number. And both he did by looking at whatever comes out should have a conserved energy. That fixes one of these numbers. And the other one says, and you should get, get, get back Newtonian gravity if you look at a situation where gravity is not too strong. So and the Newtonian gravity one fixes this number. That gives you the pi and the g. Those two constants in the Einstein field equation are the only physics in the equation. Yes. Einstein himself is very fond of saying that general relativity is a theory that comes about almost by pure thought. There's very little physics in the uh, uh, there. Let's see. Let's see if we can get things, group things back together again. What went into general relativity to begin with? Reducing it to Yes. The physics went into you have to specify this number and that number. This number is specified due to the fact that whatever came out had to reduce to Newtonian physics, Newtonian gravity. This number has something to do with the conservation of energy. So whatever the universe or space time does should have conserved energy. And we put the equivalence principle in. The whole idea that you can write space time or gravity as a curvature of space time, that's just a mathematical statement of the equivalence principle. So Einstein in 10 years' time, just thought gravity should be a curvature of space-time. Hence, it should be written at this thing. Then Helmholtz theory takes over, and then whatever comes out should look like this, and that's just finding numbers. So it, it's no idea why it took a genius 10 years to come up with that idea. It sounds so simple now, right, in retrospect. <laughs> anyway, your bigger question was, where does this pi come from? That's that pi. These two, and that's a break, but these two are the Friedman equations. What we're going to do after the break is we're going to play around with them. We're going to say, you know what? Let's take a universe that has so much matter in it and this amount of pressure. Let's calculate the A as a function of T. How will that universe scale up or scale down as a function of time? We're going to solve some frequent equations. Break first. All right. This is just for you. Yes, yes, yes. 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 
I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> No, in all seriousness, I uh, uh, should show you what our first draft is. Uh, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. I can wait till the academic advice. Yeah, that's yeah, in a week from now. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, week from now. Yes. Okay, people, uh, let's continue. So I have no idea what this episode of Cosmo Girl is. Oh, Cosmo Girl. I have no idea. I don't watch any of this. I don't watch that. What is it? She wasn't afraid. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Was it like called Gossip Girl? No. <laughs> okay. It was absolutely nothing like Gossip Girl. Okay, okay, okay. They won't, they won't insult you. No, I, 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 I don't watch any of these shows. So I have no idea what I don't show, either. Really. But I hear that there's a series called Gossip Girl and that people watch it. Okay? <laughs> and as you know, we've talked about this before. There's only one objective. Real seriously, you should look, which is Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> Again, <laughs> this is objective, what I'm saying now. <laughs> so general relativity and practice. Okay. Any of some fun, okay. So what else do you want? Okay. Yeah. So um, we have, what, 20 minutes-ish or so? Right. A little bit less. That's fine. Um, we are going to solve the Friedman equations for some particular situations. Let me write them down one more time. <laughs> this is a uh, topic that is very close to my heart. Well, there's lots of things that's close to my heart, but this one is even more so, and that is that I did my master's in theoretical cosmology. So I spent two years just studying the Friedman equations, but super interesting is uh, what if you have an expanding space time and on top of that you put quantum mechanics. So you have quantum mechanics in an expanding space time. So this is where quantum mechanics and relativity came together. Yes, they don't like each other very much, but uh, in some certain approximation it worked and you, you, know, you get all these beautiful results. So uh, unfortunately no quantum mechanics here. It's just the Friedman equations. These are the two. I hope you understand conceptually what they say. Somebody tells you how much matter and energy there is in the universe, these two numbers. And these two equations will spit out what A is, is a function of T, and we already saw A is a function of T means that the universe is expanding. If A of, the T, uh, A of T becomes more and more negative, it means that your sphere, your Minkowski space time, or your hyperboloid becomes smaller. Which means that all points in the universe are being contracted towards each other. Okay? So if you want to know what the universe will do in time, either in the future or in the past, what you're looking for is, first of all, this number, its size, but more objectively you're looking for a dot. A itself just means how far two particular points are away from each other. That's not too interesting. If I want to know how far away I am from you, I can just take a measuring rod and do the calculation and do the measurement, right? If I want to know what will happen in the future and or the past, I have to check whether the intermediate space is growing or uh, becoming smaller. So it means I'm looking for the derivative of the scale factor. This is the object that you're looking for. Why is it formulated as a fraction over a... Well, that's another way of saying that A itself really doesn't matter that much. Because whatever size, whatever, however it expands, is always related to how big it is right now. So that means that if I decide to make uh, the scale factor 100 times bigger, not because the time makes it 100 times bigger, not because the universe does so, but because I change my unit system from meters to centimeters, and all my numbers will get 100 times bigger, yes? But that just means that if this becomes 100 times bigger and this becomes 100 times bigger, their relationship to the energy and density is still the same because the others will drop out. That makes physical sense, doesn't it? Yes. You don't expect the amount of, of, of how much expansion or contraction you have to be dependent on how you accidentally chose your meters or centimeters your base unit. So the, the short answer is it drops, this is the way that it comes out of the Isaac field equations. But the, the physical interpretation of the fact that it comes in ratios is that the expansion of the universe should not depend on how you chose your meters or centimeter coordinate system. Now, if this number is bigger than one, that means you have an expanding universe. Every two points in the universe are going to be scaled up. Think about the sphere, two dots on the sphere. The universe blows up, then every two dots will lie further and further away from each other. If this is smaller than zero, it's a negative number, 
that means that every two dots on the sphere, or your Minkowski sphere time, or your hyperboloid, in time will get closer to each other and things contract towards each other. So, this means <coughs> expand the universe. And this means an, uh, we call it contracting universe or so. And before we actually put in any rows and P's, any specifics, what kind of matter and what kind of energy you have in the universe, there's already just based on the mathematical way that these are written, a couple of conclusions that you can draw. One of them is, look at the second frequency equation if you will, claim A dot dot is always negative. Can you see that that is the case from the mathematics alone? It comes with a minus sign, yes, but that's not enough. In order for the whole right hand side to be negative, it means that the overall minus sign should not be compensated with some internal minus sign, that rho plus 3 times p itself is not negative. Can somebody make a quick claim why rho well, plus 3 p is not negative? Pressure and energy density, right? Yeah, there, yeah. So, so it has to be everything is positive. It has to be positive. There's always a certain plus amount of kilograms per cubic meter. Maybe there's zero, but there's not minus kilograms per cubic meter. Same with, same with pressure. Things push against you, plus pressure. You don't have particles bouncing against you and then sucking you back in or something like that. <laughs> Negative pressure. So, just from having your basic understanding of what rho and P is, you know that this part is always positive, so this whole thing is always negative. What does that mean physically if A dot dot apparently is always a negative number? It's going to be like this. Uh, yes, but. That graphite could be right, but in physical terms. The rate of expansion just slows slows down. down. The rate of expansion slows down. So it doesn't matter if you already started with something that was expanding or contracting, the amount of expanding or becomes smaller in time. So even if it started out expanding quite rapidly, this is a big number, a dot dot being negative means that this number will decrease. Even if it is positive itself, it's change is negative, always. But to me that makes physical sense. Because if there's one nice thing about gravity is that it pulls things towards each other. So you have some universe that is expanding, and the second, the, how much it expands is given by the first Friedman equation, but the second Friedman equation says no, 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 but the expansion should slow down. Again, gravity-wise that makes sense, right? trying to kick a couple of balls away from each other, but all these balls are connected by springs and try to pull them back. Even if you give them quite a big kick, the amount of velocity with which they fly away is going to be negative. I'm sure somebody wants to say something about dark energy at this point. <laughs> because if there's one thing that we have known for, well, since 1998, is that the universe is actually expanding. If you do the measurement, a dot dot is positive. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> so there's, there's one Friedman equation that doesn't work. There's a Nobel Prize that uh, in 2011 it went to uh, three scientists, I think two Australians, one American, two Americans, one Australian, I forget, um, that uh, actually measured by supernova data that the universe is expanding. So that this number is actually, uh, uh, actually positive. It just means that these numbers, that there is some energy density or pressure in the universe that comes with very exotic properties. This is what we call, for lack of a better word, dark energy. Yes. You can actually read off what dark energy should be. So there's this unknown stuff that makes the universe expand. It's not an explanation, it's just another way of phrasing that we see that the universe accelerates, it exists expansion. You can immediately tell that whatever dark energy is, it means that rho plus 3 p must be uh, smaller than zero itself. What observation showed that it was accelerating? That's supernova data. Uh -huh. um, the supernova data has, has the nice property that you can tell, uh, that, that, you, that you know what kind of light you would expect from a supernova. Mm -hmm. Because you know what to expect, you can also see how much it is blue shifted or red, red shifted. And the further away something is, the more blue shift you would expect because of the expansion. And if the universe was uh, deaccelerating, you would expect the blue shift to become less and less and less for objects that are further away. It's actually more and more and more. That's how they did it. 
Now, this is an industry. Yes. Finding out how that works is an industry. I can tell you some hints how that works, but now is not the time. So I'm very happy to talk about this at some point. One hint, quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics can make, can make this work. So if all the people always try to drag in quantum mechanics, yucko stuff into here, there's actually a reason here. <laughs> Uh, in quantum mechanics, you can make this condition hold. Now, we're going to stick for now to just classical non-quantum mechanical physics, and then um, you would expect the universe to de-accelerate. But uh, imagine the surprise when people found that the universe is accelerating based on that this thing says that it should. By the way, one other option is that maybe the Einstein equations were not correct to begin with. So the Friedman equations had a mistake in there. That's another industry, people finding out are there any deviations from general relativity that could account for this. Anyway, unknown issue, nobody knows at this point. So let's, let's stay in uh, safe waters here and just look at normal physics. Um, so yeah, you can tell immediately that the universe, um, in, under normal circumstances, assuming general relativity, can only deaccelerate. We can do a little bit more too. Remember that I said at the beginning that the universe is about 14 billion years old? <coughs> if you do it exactly, it's 13.9 billion years. 13.8, excuse me. Plus or minus 1%. Let's see. Measurement accuracy. <coughs> we can actually get it from here as well. Any ideas how to do this? How can you tell how big the universe, how old the universe is? You know how fast, what the rate of expansion is, so you can just go back to you're full of constant physics. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's absolutely fine. Listen, if you want, uh, this number just tells you how, how, how fast the car is driving, yes. Okay. <coughs> uh, the moment that the universe, back in time, the moment that the universe was you know, all contracted to one point is when the scale factor A itself is zero. Agreed? So if you're able to measure this number right now, and you measure this number right now, how fast the car is moving, how, fa how far it has driven. You can calculate back when it started driving. <laughs> okay, you can do that calculation. The good thing is you can measure this number. A dot over A is a number that you can measure by uh, looking out how fast galaxies are receding from uh, the Earth. This is uh, the Hubble's law. Do we know what K is? Or could K still be anything? It could still be anything, but it doesn't change his argument. It, it just means that whether the car was driving over a curved slope or has to went up against a hill or was a flat uh, plane it drives. So it, it changes the number, but it doesn't change the order of magnitude much. Now, if you would put that in, this number, a dot over a, you can again, you can measure. And in the units that astronomers use, it's about 70, depending on who you ask, plus or minus two or so, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. It's a number. You have to convert it back to standard units, <coughs> put it back into here, and uh, then you can calculate back how old the universe is. In fact, let's do it right now. Delta T, let's use my metaphor again, how long the car has been driving. Okay? That is about, sure, it depends on what kind of curvature you had and all these things, but it's about the uh, uh, how big the universe is right now, given by the scale factor, divided by how fast the car was driving. Right? Delta x over v gives you delta t. This number, if you want, is just the inverse of this number. So that means the only thing that you have to do as an astronomer is measure how much <coughs> matter and energy you have per unit volume in the universe. We can do this measurement. In fact, we started this lecture by showing you two pictures so you can get that number. Get this number, put it in here, and there you go. There's the age of the universe. Again, if you would do the measurement, then this, by the way, this is called h, the Hubble constant. Ridiculous misnomer because it's not a constant. A dot depends on time, and a depends on time. So the thing depends on time, but still it's called the Hubble constant. This current value is 70 kilometers per second per, uh, excuse me, per second per megaparsec. Now, revert those numbers back to SI units. Uh, be sure to put your G's and your C's back in. 
Yes, because G is E1 and C is 1, so you have to be careful a little bit. And then you'll find that delta T is about 10 to the power 9 years. And if you do more accurately, you get about 14. So, excuse me, to the 10. And if you do it more accurately, it's about 14 years. 14 billion years. So that's beautiful, right? So already for the Friedman equations, and doing a simple measurement, how many hydrogen atoms do you encounter per cubic meter, you have the age of the universe. Uh, that's the power of general relativity for you. So that's pretty cool. Let's do another statement. I'm sure at some point in your reading about the universe, because everybody finds this interesting, you have heard about the possibility, maybe, that the universe will contract, it will expand. We already saw that it stops. Uh, uh, excuse me, that it, that it will deaccelerate at some point. If we leave out the dark energy part, then maybe it stops expanding, but the deacceleration keeps on going on because the minus doesn't go away and it starts falling back into itself. You can do that calculation as well. Does that happen? Again, now that we know now we know about the dark energy part, we know that it won't. Okay. But before 1998, before they did that measurement, one viable option was that the universe at some point would stop contract and stop expanding and contract back into itself, right? And some inverse Big Bang, uh, Big Crunch is what they usually call these things. Well, we can make a statement about that as well. Do you agree with me that the the, the statement that the universe will stop expanding and then contract back into itself means that the expansion velocity should have been zero at some point, at halfway point. Okay, so if you want a universe that starts to contract onto itself, at the very least what you will have is a universe that has stopped expanding at some point, <coughs> has reached some maximum value for its size. That means a dot should be zero. This you need to fulfill in order to have a contracting universe. Let's take this one. It means left hand side of the first Friedman equation should be zero. But that means that this should have been true. The only way that you can up, end up with a universe that does this big crunch thing is when the rho and the curvature are related in this very peculiar fashion. This is just me doing the mathematics. In fact, I write it like this, 3 a to pi rho, I forget a k, excuse me, this is the 1 over a squared k, this is it, yeah. Okay. For which of the three <coughs> cosmological principle universes can this be done? There's three options, spherical, hyperbolic, and Minkowski flat. Well, the one that k will be get on zero? Yes. Which is Spherical. Yes. Yeah. Apparently, I mean, if you have a universe that is itself not empty, so rho is not zero, that means that left hand side is a positive number. That means that right hand side should be a positive number, and that the only way to make that work is when k is positive, which is indeed a spherical universe. So the only option that you would have for a universe that contracts back into itself would be to have a spherical, of the three options, have the spherical version. Now, do we have a spherical universe? What is this value of k? Let's take the uh, Occam's razor again. You had a very st strict preference for which of the three options that, that it was, right? Yeah. No. The Minkowski one, right? That's, yeah, I still stick with that. Okay. I would say it's a huge coincidence of all the chi types of curvature that you would have, because spherical comes in all types of values. Right? You can have a big sphere, you can have a small sphere but you can only have one flatness. So in a certain way, there's more statistical reason to think of a, uh, it's, okay. it's, it, it's a crappy argument. We shouldn't go with it. Expand, like it's expand, like it's anyway, it. so the. No, you're right, it's a crappy argument. I'm just saying there's no principal preference for one over the other. No, I mean, I agree maybe. with that. I totally agree okay. with that. Well, now, it seems nice. <coughs> um, you can do measurements on K. The more you look at the universe, the more you can say something about its overall curvature properties. And you'll find, up to percent level accuracy, that the universe of the three options, happen, nature happens to have chosen the flat one. Is that from experimental evidence? Yes. Yes. 
So yes, your intuition, if you will, was right. It's just backed up by, by, by measurement this time. So we know that it's a Minkowski Yes, uh, well, an expanding, because it's Minkowski space time with a scale factor built in. Oh, okay. Yes, We're so 100% we, sure. Well, you, in, uh, if you base yourself on measurements, it's not 100% sure in physics, but it's in, within percent level, yes. Now, um, that means that these equations become a lot more simple, agreed? In fact, let's take this one, as to, let's say that's just a measured fact, and put those, that option into the Friedman equation. Again, the Friedmans allow for all the three types, but yeah, let's go with this one. I over 3 rho plus 3p. Oh, this cleans our stuff. Over time. Damn it, I want to show you a solution. Are you okay with a couple of minutes so I can show you some uh, solutions to this? Yeah. In principle, you can solve this now. The only thing you have to do is specify to me what rho is and what uh, the pressure is. And you can relate this and you can solve this system and you can find A. Now, um, suppose that you have a universe that's completely filled with matter. There's also energy. Let's focus on the matter part for now. Just particles floating around. Could be many particles, could be few particles, could be red bricks, could be turtles, could be people, could be stars, but just normal matter. How about this? Does this feel good to you? As an assumption for how your energy density depends on the scale factor? Well, that's my question to you. Huh? Yes. I'm assuming a universe where there's only matter. Just no tangible particles. And then I say, well, if that is the case, then my rho, my energy density, must be 1 over uh, the scale factor to the cube. Maybe because when it is small, then everything is concentrated. And so R is big, so it kind of makes sense that way. I think I agree. I mean, you have three dimensions. But I don't know why it is like you. Okay, well, three dimensions. So it's it, it, a row is it is by definition. I mean, that's how we put it in. It was the the, the energy density of this gas, right? This Friedman gas that fills the universe. Now, a density is a certain amount of stuff per unit volume. Oh, okay, so because it's three dimensions. Yes, exactly. So, because so a refers like to only one dimension. Uh, no, but because if you say that it would be 1 over A, then you're saying that one of the three dimensions expands in, in, in space and the other two stay the same. That's against the cosmological principle because it should expand in the same way in all three dimensions. Well, but that means then that A refers like to is like something like a radius of like how much is expanding? Yes. Okay. That's what the scale factor tells you. The scale factor has as its physical interpretation how far away any two points are in space. Now, a volume consists of this distance, this distance, and I forget which one I have. This distance, thank you. <laughs> right? A cube. And each of these three dimensions scales up with the scale factor A. And by the same amount, that's the cosmological principle, that it, it, it expands homogeneously, right? It's in the same way at any po point in space. That means that a volume goes with A to the cube. Now, I have no idea what is going to be in a, in a numerator. That's how much matter you happen to have. But its, it's, it's functional dependence on the scale factor itself is going to be 1 over A3. I have no idea what this number is. Let's just call it, I don't know, the amount of mass, something like that, whatever that is. <coughs> Suppose that you have a very empty universe on top of that. So there is mass, it's just there's not a lot of it. How much pressure do you, would you expect? Very small. Very small. Let's make it zero. It is close to zero. It's, it's one hydrogen atom per cubic meter. Yes? It's a small number. So yes, of course, it's not exactly true, but it's true-ish enough. Just to give you an idea. That means the frequency equations just tells you A 
dot over a squared, blah, 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 equals 1 over a to the cube. Uh, there's no pressure here at this point. This is 1 a to the 3 again. Then you have a set of two differential equations where a dot, the derivative of the unknown function a, is defined in terms of a itself. It's a differential equation. And what you can solve. So an empty universe, it's not empty, but it's a, it's a very dilute universe, dilute Friedman gas, with normal particles, and by normal I just mean that their energy density goes down with the, the, the volume, will give you A as a function of T. This is the solution to the differential equation. Yeah, I'm skipping the derivation itself, but uh, I don't think you would have any trouble solving this, right? Or the easy way is even to do it the other way around. Take my solution, put it back in, and see that it fits. So how does this universe look? How does it expand? We have our A now as a function of t, so it says something about how big the universe is getting in time. Start there. It's bigger, but it's bigger. Okay. increasing. Okay. And does it's it's getting bigger, get bigger? Okay. So it, it curves back down, yes? So it goes up, but it does it's it's acceleration if you become smaller. Now how beautiful is this? You start with the, if you would have an empty universe with normal particles in there, you know exactly how it how it will behave as a universe gets older and older. Let's do one more. So this is for matter. Let's take a universe now that's filled with radiation. These photons, or gravitational waves, neutrinos, or whatever Yaku comes up with. Let's take the energy of those photons. See if you can make sense of this, a to the 4. It's true. I'm just waiting for somebody to tell me why that is true. So forget about the matter particles. It's now just photons. And I'm saying as the universe gets more voluminous, the density of the photons goes down not with a cube, but to a power four. It's a cube plus an extra <coughs> scale factor. Why is it because you know, you agree with this? That it's at the, at the very least it does this? Mm -hmm. Because the volume goes up with a cube? Is it because the expansion also um, affects the energy in the line, so it gets stretched out and there you go. Up? Photons or electromagnetic radiation, regardless, you can look at it particle physics way or the classical way. Well, let's do the classical way, yes. As a wavelength, the wavelength determines its energy. Now, as the universe expands, the wavelength has to expand along with it. That means it, the, the, that the energy goes down still, the light, the, the, the light becomes more red. Right? Bigger wavelengths means less energy, more red light. Now, that wavelength stretching only happens with 1a because the light is only traveling in one of the three dimensions. So you get one cube from the volume getting bigger, and you get an additional a due to the redshift, to the, to the stretching of the wavelength. So this will be the a to the 4. The pressure that corresponds to it, I'm just going to give it to you comes from electrodynamics. You can calculate uh, what the pressure is when photons start hitting, hitting against you. I mean, maybe you've seen this exercise before in some context. If not, that's fine.
Well, you do understand that photons or light, they interact with you, right? If, if they start bouncing against you, they exchange a certain amount of energy with you that gives you a little push. If you go through electrodynamics, you don't even need quantum mechanics. If you go through electrodynamics, then the amount of pushing obviously has something to do with how much energy they're transferring to you. So it is some relationship with the energy density. And if you work through the mathematics, you will find that the <coughs> constant in between is one third. So this is just a statement of photons bouncing against you, giving you a little bit of extra energy. So it must be P is something energy less then a number comes in, that number is related. Same exercise. Put row R here is one uh, over A4. Uh, put P, put it in here, gives you another one over A4. Solve. to a, a, small, a smaller number, right? So it'll be something like this. So if you have a universe, you just fill it with photons, it will expand. It will also slow down its expansion. But notice that, first of all, the expansion goes slower. But secondly, the deacceleration is itself a smaller number. So photons apparently tend to contract the universe a little bit less than matter does. It doesn't feel too strange to me, to be honest. I mean, I'm used to matter pulling, pushing, pulling other matter. And photons do the same, but maybe not as much. <coughs> you actually find that fact. These are just two examples. There's many more. The exercise for the tutorial have you go through all different kinds of options. You get all kinds of beautiful expansions, including the dark energy possibility. So, thank you for indulging me for another 15 minutes. My bigger point here was, take the cosmological principle. Use it to take an estimated guess for the energy density T mu nu, an estimated guess for your um, uh, space-time metric, connect them together, Fitness equations, and now for every universe that you might be interested in, just take your pick for the energy and for the for the pressure, and you can solve what the universe will do in time. So can you just add the graphs together? That is a good point. Question: Can you add the graphs together? Suppose if you have a universe with both matter and photons in there, which as far as I know is the universe that we live in. Can you just say, well, you know what? That's probably the sum of these two solutions. Slower, that, that is, the, I like that argument because you would expect if you would put more stuff in, then the total amount of expansion should be less, and the adding them together would indicate that it decreases even more. There's also a mathematical argument. Usually, if you have differential equations like the Friedman equations, and you would have two sources, two different rows that you put in, you get two solutions. But the sum of these solutions is itself also a solution. It's a property of a linear differential equation. The Friedman equation is not linear. Because look, the thing that you're looking for, A, A itself, is squared. So the sum of these two things, well, you can immediately tell. Without a square, you would have two different A's, each A corresponding to the two different rows. But now because of the square, you get one row square, the other row square, plus their mutual interaction. And that doesn't split up on the other side into uh, different rows. Your right hand side gives you two different rows, whereas your left hand side would give you three terms. So there's a mismatch there. So no, you cannot add these two together. But if you would have a universe with both matter and photons in there, you cannot just take these solutions, 
you have to solve it all the way from scratch again. What do we get if we solve it? Like, do we get something like, like a smaller curvature or something? Well, the answer is uh, you have to ask about the math can Because now it's, it's, these differential equations are ridiculously difficult to solve. These are simple examples. The real life situation, because of the non-linearity non needs, it's probably a numerical uh, exercise that you have to do by mathematics. But I, what I hear, heard here was a very good argument. I expect the total graph to be a smaller number. But it doesn't expand as much because it's more contracting, because you have added more stuff to it. Now, one exercise that I will have you do during the tutorial is, suppose that you would add dark energy to the stuff. The stuff that makes the universe expand faster. Here's a claim. You will see this during the tutorial throughout the week. If you have a universe where you have a little bit of matter and a little bit of photons, in fact, take an enormous amount of matter, an enormous amount of photons, the smallest droplet of dark energy that happens to be in there will ultimately always win. So a universe where only a small amount of dark energy is in there will at some point completely wash out the, the other two influences and the universe will expand faster and faster even though you started out with stuff to try to pull everything together. <coughs> the pushing away will always win from the pulling together stuff. That's an exercise. You will see this if you solve this. And it's bad news. It means that it means that you can never compensate the expansion of the universe, the accelerated expansion, just by adding more stuff in there. You will always really end up add more stuff, okay? Sorry? You can't really add more stuff. No, but okay. suppose that you could. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but if you don't add it, then it just ends in a big grid, right? Uh, 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 big grid. Big grid. No, only if, if you have yeah. a spherical universe. Only if k is, uh, is 1. Ah, because the, the crunching, the pulling back together, only works for spherical universes. Okay.